Hello, and welcome back to Kvik Minderpod, an Icelandic cinema podcast. I'm Rob Watts, and on this podcast I discuss 21st century Icelandic film with my good friend Ellie Cawthorn. We're back with a second bonus episode in a week, and this time we're out on the water in Kvalvjörde for a Halloween or Hrekjavaka special. Halloween means horror, so we watched one of the few Icelandic horror films out there, Reykjavik Whale Watching Massacre from 2009. And joining us to dissect this movie and give his expert opinion is Mike Munzer from the Evolution of Horror podcast, our very first special guest. Now I just want to give a quick trigger warning that while this is an entertaining and completely fictional horror movie, it does open with real-life archive footage of whales being hunted and slaughtered. So be prepared, and if you don't fancy seeing it, just skip the credits. Ready? Let's do this. Hey Ellie. Hi Rob, how's it going? Very good, thanks. How are you? I'm alright, I'm alright. We're doing a special episode for the first time ever. It's Halloween, and for that reason we've brought in an extra very special guest, Mike Munzer from the Evolution of Horror. Woohoo! How are you doing, Mike? Hello! Thank you for having me. What an honour to be your first guest <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, thank you for, uh, for joining us. It's, uh, it's quite amazing, really. We've never had anyone on the line with us, and uh, I'm wondering how we're gonna we're gonna tackle this. <laughs> well, there's so much to say about this masterpiece <laughs> as well, so I'm sure we'll be fine. <laughs> okay, okay. And that masterpiece is a uh, Reykjavik whale watching massacre from 2009. <laughs> it's funny because every film we've discussed on this podcast so far has had an Icelandic title as well mm. as the English title. This one does not. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I found really stressful about this film's title? Is that somewhere it has a different title, Harpoon, colon, Reykjavik, Whale Watching Massacre, which is exactly like I have to read a lot of non-fiction books in my job, and that's what they all do. (laughs) They have like a jazzy title that's a bit ambiguous, colon, boring explanation of what it's actually about. And this is exactly what this film title does. (laughs) It's like BBC Four TV documentaries. Exactly. You know what you're going to get when um, you look at the title of this film. Mm-hmm. You certainly do. It does It does what it says on the tin, <laughs> exactly. I think, this one, doesn't it? Exactly. And yeah. so, Mike, I know that your, at least your favourite horror film is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm-hmm. Until you saw this one, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so I'm very keen to, uh, to know what you made of this uh, because it's quite clearly um, alluding in some ways, to that film. Yes. Um, So we'll come to that. So why'd you come to Iceland? I hope you didn't come for the whale watching. Doesn't look like there's any. Do you like my boat? Sayonara, shitheads. I want to see the fucking wind! There's somebody coming. What is it gonna do with that? Don't you fucking get it? It's going to kill us both. I can't believe it. I'm going to trip my honeymoon. Bye, creep. So this is, yeah, Reykjavik Whale Watching Massacre, 2009, directed by Julius Kemp, written by Sjön, who, uh has a lot better credits to his name than this film, I must say. Have you guys ever heard of Sean? No. No. And he, that's, is it just, there's no last name. I love it. Well, he does have a last name, but he, yeah, he's like Madonna. He's the Madonna of the Icelandic <laughs> literature world. Love it. So Sean, to give you some background, just wrote Lamb. What? Oh. I'm so yeah. confused because he... Uh, I've watched both of these films in the last week and I couldn't imagine two pretty polar opposite films. 
So that's a really interesting development. I guess it's 12 years ago since this was made. 11 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean he's I he's one of Iceland's sort of foremost poets and writers. He's been nominated for an Oscar. He wrote sort of a whole bunch of Björk songs. Hmm. The Dancer in the Dark Connection, and we've talked about Lars von Trier a lot, me and you, Mike. Yes. Uh, but Schoen wrote I've Seen It All for Björk and Lars von Trier for that film. And that was in the late 90s. And now we've got this. Wow. It very much sounds like he's gone on to bigger and better things, but if I'm not sure that I would have guessed the person who wrote this was a poet. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true I, but that is the last thing i would have assumed to be honest that he that l- i'm just looking at his his wikipedia page now and all the amazing stuff he's done and he's got he's co-writing something with robert eggers yes the next robert eggers film that's going to be starring björk someone managed to bring björk back to the acting realm after the nightmare that was uh dancer in the dark wow yeah, you would not think this was the guy that made this movie we're about to talk about. That's amazing. <laughs> it's it's pretty mad, isn't it? And yeah. so for that reason, I've got I've got one thesis on this film, <laughs> which I which I will let you know in a bit. But it can't be as bad as it seems. Is basically yeah. what I'm thinking. But shall I give it a little synopsis and we can take it from there? Yeah, please do. So, a group of tourists takes a whale watching trip off the coast of Iceland. When the captain struggles to find any whales to watch, he puts the call out for any sightings. Unfortunately, the response he gets is from a family of murderous cannibals intent on killing them all. Are they cannibals? Well, they call their first kill, the guy who's held in the hull, their meal, their next meal. So, yeah, I would suggest so. I mean, it doesn't feel like they're uh, actually out to eat anybody, I suppose, in the rest of the film, but... I thought that was a kind of allusion to we used to go and catch whales and eat them and now we're going to catch humans, you know, our next catch. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, yeah, that's, the whole thing is some sort of pun on the decline of the whaling industry. Mm. Yeah. But Texas Chainsaw Massacre itself, they're cannibals, right? Yes, they're definitely cannibals, yeah. They yeah. They they work in a slaughterhouse, don't they? And they, mm-hmm. they, kill, and, they kill and eat people, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, but actually that... I didn't get that from this movie. I thought they would just... I thought they just enjoyed murdering people, basically. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Fair fair enough. Yeah. Sorry, Rob, to call you out on your synopsis before we've even begun. (laughs) I've never done that before. (laughs) Uh, Okay, maybe I'm just sort of desperately trying to cling on to those Texas Chainsaw Massacre illusions that maybe just aren't there. But, Mike, maybe you can tell us any bits that might relate to to tcm was there anything in this film well it wasn't i wouldn't say it was really directly sort of similar but but i guess the 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 overall story right vaguely in that you've got this group of people who are out on this boat and then they get they sort of bump into a bunch of hillbillies on the water right fish billies i think fish billies in some in some um synopses (laughs) and uh and then kind of suffer the consequences of that really and uh, and are all sort of picked off so i guess like very loosely it's mm. got that sort of slight um there is a term that we use quite a lot in the horizon we call exploitation which is that kind of area right which is like wrong turn and all those types of movies where it's like people go down some sort of horrible back of the beyond place <laughs> and they come across these kind of hillbilly types you know stereotypical type of characters who are always murderous and you know crazy uh, and i guess this film kind of fits that it's sort of a exploitation film on the water isn't it really so i guess in that regard it's like texas chainsaw in every other way i'd say it isn't really like texas chainsaw <laughs> um it's... like te- texas chainsaw massacre famously obviously like it doesn't really have much gore or violence it's one of those films that mm. has that reputation as being really extreme but actually you see very very little there's barely a drop of blood shed on on screen and uh there's barely anyone that's actually killed by a chainsaw i think there's one death (laughs) by chainsaw so there's not a chainsaw massacre at all that's a lie that title um but on this we do get a lot of really grisly gory on-screen kills as well it's true Mm. i think i think for me 
part of my issue was the execution of it. Mm. So I actually I actually quite liked the premise, you know, that these guys were whale hunters back in the day and their industry had been destroyed, that they were bitter about all the tourists that were coming to Iceland. I thought the premise worked quite well, but when we got down to it, it was the execution that didn't really live up to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think maybe the problem for me was, which I'm sure we'll get into, is that I kind of loathed all of the characters, right? Uh-huh. They are awful apart from maybe what apart from our kind of main character maybe um he was all right but everyone else was sort of a bit all over the place you know yeah i've got many notes written down i've got everyone is a twat yes everyone is racist yes everyone is awful like it's a really kind of and i i I was trying to work out if it was trying to sort of satire or comment on something but every character is a bigot in some way, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's really difficult to spend time with these characters. I think that's what made the film a, a struggle at points, right? Yeah, I think you're right. I also think that that's also the point. I, yeah. I, my, I basically, I think Sean is basically gone, right, well, I know horror films. So here I am going to chuck in every horror cliche you can imagine. I'm going to make everyone horrible. And this is really just about, you know, killing a bunch of people alluding to some other horror films and trolling us, basically. just See, I think my issue, it wasn't necessarily that everybody was horrible, because as you say, it can be quite enjoyable to to have a cast of villains and then watch them get picked off one by one. Mm. I think that my issue was that they were horrible in ways that felt quite awkward and also yeah. stereotypical. So, so you had the Japanese guy who was really sexist, and you had... Um, the French guy, for example, who was drunk and said ooh la la all the time. That was my issue rather than them explicitly being terrible people. Yeah, I think that's, again, I am i don't know why I'm trying to defend this film to, in that respect, but I'm sure that that has to be done on purpose. I think so. They can't be caric- caricatures that much and be, he'd be unaware of, of having done that. Well, especially now, Rob, you've told me a bit about this writer who clearly must be quite a smart guy by the sounds of it, like all the stuff he's done. So there is something in there, I'm sure, that maybe he was saying, but maybe it got lost in the execution, right? Maybe it's just it wasn't as well directed as it could have been, or the performances, Mm -hmm. or I don't know, something has been lost there and it ends up just feeling a bit unpleasant doesn't it really? yeah well should we should we cycle back and uh, and start at the beginning mm. where we're introduced to our main you know core group of characters <coughs> are you okay are you okay, okay. yeah <coughs> Shit. Oh. sorry sorry no it's okay sorry there you go yeah, thank you. Use this. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh please. Excuse my wife, my very ugly, stupid wife. It's okay. Did you hear what he just called her? Everybody gets sick sometimes. Oh, it's ugly, okay. uh, it's okay. stupid wife. No, it's okay. There's a word for this in English. Male chauvinistic pig, and we have a very good translation of it in Icelandic. Umgrotta. Oh, I'm very sorry. Very sorry. Yeah, so it's Pungrotta. Oh, hi, hi. Pungrotta. Thank you. So it starts with a couple of tourists, American tourists, or, or wherever they're from, at a bar, watching some music, having a few drinks. They are doing the classic touristy thing of, you know, what's good here, and they fall into the trap of some local says he knows the guy from Cigarros, which I think everyone in... Iceland knows each other uh, and everyone knows a member of Sigurós everyone's met Björk everyone knows where she lives which also made me find it hard to believe that a group of murderous whale hunters could just exist and no one would know who they were or what what they were doing Mm -hmm. But, but that's beside the point so we have these two tourists one of whom goes back to this guy's flat the other one goes to her hotel and she's late in the next the next morning for her whale watching trip And like you said, Ellie, we've got those guys, we've got the Japanese tourists, the couple and their sort of helper, Endo. Mm -hmm. I don't know, is she their helper or their daughter? I'm not really sure. She kind of, they behave like she's a member of staff or something. Yeah. 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 Mm. And then we've got Leon, who's the black guy. We've got Marianne, 
who it initially seems like they might be a couple. Yes. But it turns out she's actually on a honeymoon on her own because her boyfriend died in a car crash. That wasn't very well drawn out, that situation. And yeah, no. Mm. Well, none of the characters were. <laughs> and also, those two are meant to be American, aren't they? Oh, my God, those terrible... Terrible hammy American accents. I I had to actually look these actors up, and they were both British actors because Are I they? couldn't possibly believe that they were meant to be American. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they definitely had that English trying to be American kind mm. of accent. <laughs> Fair. Uh, and then we've also got the French guy with the most caricature name ever, Jean Francois, <laughs> and a group of older ladies. One of whom is Icelandic, and I think her friends are German children's TV producers, which mm. is a strange fact. I do wonder whether they're the kind of TV producers who, Ellie, you might remember the TV show in A White White Day, which we're going to talk about soon. Maybe they're the kind of people who would make a show like that. Basically, a, Mike, it was a, a children's TV show that basically shows the end of the world. There's like a plane crash and all these children die. Oh my God. Yeah, it's pretty mad. Anyway, wow. one of those women is Haldora Gehastatir, who we've seen a couple of times this series, who is one of Iceland's kind of biggest actresses. Oh. Yeah, which was a big surprise seeing her in this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like we always say, everyone pops up in everything. So if you need an Icelandic lady, get Haldora. If you need a ship's captain, why not get Leatherface himself? What? Yes, yeah, indeed. Did you know that? Did you know that Gunnar Hansen was Icelandic? No, I did not actually. No, I I didn't even, I had to like, because I knew he looked familiar (laughs) and I was like, do I know that guy or does he just look like a generic beardy chip captain? I wasn't yeah. sure. And then uh, looked it up and obviously I was like, wow, it's, it's, it's Gunnar Hansen from actual Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's amazing and really fun that they got him in it. But no, I had no idea. Neither did I. Pretty cool though. Yeah. Um, and again, it's one of those ties to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that you know doesn't really mean a lot, but it's, it's good, good for the horror nerds. Absolutely. Yeah, so true. So all these tourists, they join him on this boat, which is kind of confusing because they're, they, they turn up and they're like, well, oh, the boat that you're supposed to be on is, uh, is being fixed and it seems quite ominous. So they get on this other boat, but that really means nothing. It sort of felt like it was going to be a key plot point. <laughs> Yeah. But wasn't. Yeah, yeah, because when we saw the whale hunting family at the beginning and they were having their dinner in the ship's, I guess, kind of galley, hull thing, I assumed that they were just on the same boat but hiding. Ah. Me too, me too. Yes, that, that wasn't completely clear to begin with, was it? I was like, oh, so they're part of the ship crew kind of thing. They're downstairs. Mm-hmm. But I was like, how big is this boat as well? Because, yeah, until I realised it was a different boat. Yeah. Yeah, lots of different boats. And then we've got these two other characters who really do strange things. And they're probably the weirdest and maybe the most kind of, I don't know, not controversial, but they do odd things. So we've got the sort of blonde guy on mm. board the boat who takes Annette, who's the sort of most sympathetic character, and tries to rape her. I think this was actually my kind of, my main beef with this film, really, that scene. Because... Yeah. It's really not relevant to the story at all in no. any way. I mean, I know it's like it's a classic horror trope, isn't it? That let's just throw in some violence against women. But I think that here it just felt um icky, icky is the word, and and quite out of place in the story. Yeah. yeah. Completely unnecessary, wasn't it? Like I still don't know having got to the end of the film why that was in there like what was that for what was that character even in the film for like there was no no reason for any of that it was really weird i also thought that this would be something that we'd come back to yeah but then we see the guy he he escapes doesn't he on the boat on the sailboat and he just never comes back no it's weird it was like oh is it just to put this character this sort of final girl character i guess through as much torment as possible from the beginning of the film like from the moment she almost misses the boat right and then like Mm -hmm. jumps and smashes her knees on the deck of the boat she just has the worst time imaginable from Mm -hmm. that point onwards doesn't she basically they just yeah throwing in that sort of attempted rape scene was a very weird misjudged thing to do i think yeah and the only i guess the only thing that comes out of it is that uh marianne 
bumps in, walks in and sees it happening and decides to just not do anything mm. and almost, I don't know, almost criticizes Annette for being, I don't know, wanting it almost. Yeah. Uh, so it's sort of setting Marianne up as this, again, hateful person. Like yeah. them all, like they all are. And then who's that guy, Anton, I think he is, selling his wares in his plastic bag, which I think <laughs> that's another Texas Chainsaw Massacre thing. Yeah, I think that was supposed to be sort of a little bit like the hitchhiker character in the Texas Chainsaw, right? Was it? Who is the person they come across at the beginning of the film before they run into the cannibalistic family, this very strange man on the side of the road. And he's got a little bag of weird things that he burns and does weird <laughs> stuff and he freaks them all out and then they chuck him out of the van. And then later on, he turns out to be kind of part of that family, doesn't he? Oh, so um, that's quite a direct reference then, possibly. I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Um, very strange, though. I don't, again, I don't know if it was... It feels a little bit like that was... Yeah, trying to do add in a reference without actually needing to be part of this story, I think. Yeah, he could have not been slow as well he could have not been putting that on Mm -hmm. that was a very weird and weird choice it did remind me of the end of scary movie where they're parodying dewey is it dewey from scream yeah yeah and it turns out to be yeah doofy and it turns out to be like they do a usual suspect style thing and i was like it reminded me of that i you know it's not (laughs) funny like that and it's not as good as scream but i think the biggest problem with it this film is that I wasn't quite sure whether we were supposed to be laughing or not as well because like it Mm -hmm. is sort of a comedy in places right and it is sort of really darkly satirical but then again going back to the fact that they add in a rape scene and stuff is a like I think just tonally it was a Mm. really weird film wasn't it um it wasn't quite funny enough to obviously be a comedy or dark and serious enough to just be a, a really nasty horror film kind of thing How do you like it? Well, uh... <laughs> what is the word? Cozy? I don't know. You know, I showed this room to Leonardo DiCaprio when he came to Iceland. Who? Yeah. It was very friendly. Very funny. He said, can I try it? And he just jumped into it. <laughs> what a guy I was wondering before before I went into it whether it was going to be almost like a kind of piranha double d outrageous yeah. um, death by ridiculous means final destination type thing which I think would have been better but it was it took itself almost too seriously mm-hmm. but without anything really to back that up yeah, I think it was tr- it wanted to be darkly funny and Mike we've spoken on this podcast pretty much every Icelandic film has this vein of dark humor running through uh-huh. it. Yeah. Whereas here it, it does seem to be trying to do that but getting it all wrong, I think. Mm. Or a lot of it is wrong. Like you said those those scenes you just mentioned. But yes, it didn't have the kills of Final Destination, but some of those deaths were pretty cool. And the first one we get is after the French guy's being a drunk French guy, isn't it? And he's climbed up on the mast. And, I mean, what a dickhead. (laughs) (laughs) But he falls off the mast, and the one person who sort of elevates this film (laughs) is suddenly gone. I think that might have been my favourite death, though. Yeah? Stabbed through the centre with a, what, harpoon yeah was it a harpoon it was something like that wasn't it or was it like a a broken shaft of wood possibly Mm, from the ship might as well have been a harpoon yeah yeah clearly Gunnar Hansen was like I will do this film for one day and that's all you get (laughs) of my time right because he's on screen for about five minutes before he's killed yeah but it is good and again it sets up that idea doesn't it that it's going to be quite fun silly Mm. like gory schlocky accidents almost uh, mm-hmm. or yeah. something like that um and yeah i quite enjoyed this moment as well it was good yeah i mean he looks pretty cool in a in a nice sandic sweater as well <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna just putting it out there <laughs> and to be fair the gore in this film is good like the actual practical effects and the blood mm-hmm. and like the body stuff is actually quite good and effective all the way through i think it is and after that a lot of the violence is kind of 
slightly off screen, mm-hmm. but when we do see it, it's quite impactful. It's quite bloody and it's quite uh, yeah. it does its job well, I think. But you were talking about it being tonally weird. What about that moment just after that great death, which mm. start which puts them all in danger? Where Annette suddenly starts singing over the tannoy. <laughs> this, I was like, <laughs> what is happening here? Just, it, it was almost like, this is a film set in Iceland, so somebody has to sing Bjork at some point. It's so funny. I was like, you know, I'm not that familiar with Icelandic cinema. Is this just what happens in Iceland films? <laughs> like, they just have to include a Bjork song at some point. <laughs> I mean, we haven't had it happen yet, as far as I can remember. But this this is quite clearly one to appeal to the outside world. This is kind of rooted in Icelandic culture and stuff, but it's very much selling itself to the to the international horror market. I love mm-hmm. that she thought at that moment where she'd just been assaulted, somebody had just been harpooned to death on the <laughs> on the ship. That what everybody needed was a bit of singing over the tannoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's oh so quiet. I mean, it was. <laughs> Just mad. I mean, we talked about uh, the what the fuck moment in Lamb. And this was just, I mean, it's very different, but this was a very what the fuck moment. There's no mm. idea why it's there. I know what you mean, that it was like, are we meant to find this funny or is it meant to be really haunting and sinister? Yeah, that's no. so true. <laughs> There's no way. It can't have been haunting. <laughs> She's sort of in shell shock, so she starts singing. Mm. Yuck. Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, it's very strange, isn't it? It's all so quiet. <gasps> it's all so still. Anyway, we move on from Gunnar Hansen dying, poor old Petter, the ship's captain, and then we kind of get into the the main body of the film, which is the sort of second half of violence. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. From that point on, it enters pretty standard kill or be killed template, doesn't it? Just creeping around a boat, trying not to be killed, and trying to kill the baddies. The end. <laughs> yes, with with weird moments of the actual passengers being twats to each other Mm -hmm. as well right like uh, one of the first kills after that is that woman who the one of the fish billies stabs like in the face or something right but that's after someone else one of her one of the other women is like hit her around the face and made her (laughs) yeah right yeah that's a really weird moment as well i'm like what (laughs) what's happening here i actually had to rewind it because i was like did i miss something what is this whole like sequence about but she just gets hit in the face and then stabbed and that's it. You know, it's very strange. Very weird. Because, yeah. yeah, that's the the older women, isn't it? Yeah. I don't, you know, <laughs> there had to be a reason to lose the phone mm-hmm. and they were excited that the phone was working and then they got arguing over the phone. I couldn't... Don't I couldn't, try and explain it, Rob. <laughs> no. But I couldn't imagine... I think the the character's name again is like Hel- Helga, I think. Haldora Gehastatir's character. And... After seeing her as this really strong woman in Woman at War, to then suddenly, you know, arguing over a phone, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that for a second. <laughs> so no. funny. 
It's so funny. Such a strange thing. And again, I was like, ah, I think this is supposed to be funny. I think I'm supposed to be laughing at this, but I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> because also the, the fish billies, I'm going to take that term and run with it now. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. They obviously were gross and kind of creepy, but they weren't pantomimish. You know, they weren't like incredibly crazy caricatures, mm-hmm. which also adds to the like, well, is this a comedy? Is this not? It was, yeah. Yeah, and almost making the the victims, the passengers, more grotesque than the yeah. killers, right? In a way, in this film, to an extent. Yeah. yeah, and that's like very conscious choice, I suppose, for whatever reason. It did also sort of come out around, I mean, something I always am droning on about on my podcast is the, the way the horror kind of trends change. And this film was what, 2009, was it? And yeah. this was like right in the middle of a really kind of quite nasty grimy era of the horror genre when we had like the the hostel movies and the saw movies and there were a lot of films about like these types of these types of exploitation films the wrong turn films as well and that kind of hostel vibe of like ignorant sort of tourists going to places and then and then being tortured and killed by the locals Mm. basically and again this kind of follows in that trend and the best examples of those films are ones that feel like they are sort of saying something about Mm. the xenophobia or the stereotypes or whatever um but a lot of the time they they don't do that as well they're just like oh look at these scary foreigners and that kind of thing you know which this film kind of does i i see what you mean the kind of mean spiritedness of horror in those um 2010 times yeah is definitely reflected here yeah definitely and that's something that's really gone away now and the the horror genre is like kind of completely opposite direction now i think but yeah it was really like these films were nasty and angry and gory and schlocky and gross Mm -hmm. and like this film sort of firmly sits in that era i think doesn't it completely and and even down to there's quotes about it as well like it's written into the screenplay um i can't remember who says it it must be trigvi the older brother of the of the family Mm -hmm. he says they should never have let them into the country, those fucking foreigners. And all I can think is that Shun is just saying, basically hates tourists and foreigners, but also Icelanders. Mm-hmm. He basically thinks everyone is horrible and awful, and this is just a film where he gets to just vent. But it does almost doesn't quite commit enough to that. So no. it has moments where it tries to be like, oh, look, it's it's bad to be mean and horrible like there's a that really strange exchange between the two quote american characters in which she says like oh i in the middle of a massacre really not the time but she says (laughs) i like you and he says um oh i'm gay and then she's obviously offend like a bigger or whatever and then he Mm. says well i'm your only chance which is a kind of a moment of being like oh well we need to be more tolerant almost and she's very much portrayed as the the bad the one in the wrong in that sequence so it has this weird moments of being like don't be bigots don't be horrible and then it kind of like falls back on that yeah and the the fact that that main sort of character is a black gay man and he kind of almost sort of emerges as the hero is Mm. kind of a really interesting thing and even it's kind of interesting in how brutally he's then killed by the yeah. authorities at the end right and again yeah. you feel like watching it in 2021 that feels like a very deliberate interesting thing but again like yeah they just don't push any of that stuff far enough do they where you can see what sort of point they're trying to make i think mm. no they constantly just fall back onto look at these awful murderous people let's have another kill also i wasn't sure as well as this was going on whether it was going to be a sort of um eco Mm. horror film as well right that it was gonna have maybe something to say about whale hunting Mm. and the treatment of whales and that kind of thing but i'm not sure it did that either did it i don't know i mean obviously there's that moment when you know the actual whale kills (laughs) that horrible woman at the end but um other than that i I didn't really get much of that coming through Mm. either in the film and even when we see the the flip side of these whale hunters we see the kind of um green piece green Mm. piss as the (laughs) whale hunters call them uh kind of lefty intellectuals back on the mainland I don't think they're shown massively sympathetically either. They're meant mm. they're shown to be kind of self-involved and just a kind of liberal elite types. So if it is saying, "Oh, look, these terrible murderers are just trying to 
they're trying to kill whales and it's terrible. They're not showing the alternative well mm. either. It's like you say, Rob, it's like this scattergun approach of everybody's crap in some way or other. And maybe that's the point. Maybe it's just like humanity is fucked. Maybe that's what this film is about. Like, all people are awful and they should all be killed by whales at the end. Maybe that's maybe that's it. It's funny, this film was released in 2009, which was, like, basically in the middle of the financial crisis in Iceland, mm. where everyone thought, you know, I mean, the bankers were the people to blame, but, like, the whole world was falling apart in Iceland at that point. Mm-hmm. And maybe this is some sort of reaction to, to that, like, oh my God, our entire livelihood is is gone. Or is it just not that well thought out? <laughs> <laughs> don't know. Uh, just putting out there. I don't know. But let's talk about some of the good kills. Okay. Hey, goodbye, creep. Shit. Mommy says this is only for emergency. My brother says, I don't have to be nice to you. I call this an emergency. One of those deaths is pretty cool. The Japanese mm-hmm. bloke, the horrible uh, Pungrotta, as the, mm. as the Icelanders call him, male chauvinist guy. He jumps mm-hmm. overboard in his life jacket and paddles, tries to paddle to shore. That now that harpoon death is pretty cool. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's cool. good. As it's yeah. like that's a serious bit of kit. That whale harpoon, isn't it? <laughs> I like, know, I know. I did. Yeah. I spent a lot of time in this film thinking, okay, if I was on this boat, what would my strategy be? Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think my strategy would be get off and swim. But if a harpoon's coming for you, there's not much you can do. No, it was a good shot, I must say. Incredible, wasn't it? Very accurate, yeah. Yeah, because like, um, normally you'd be aiming for some ginormous whale, not some tiny little Japanese man. Yeah. If you guys were on this whale watching tour, I don't know if you've ever been on a whale watching tour, uh, and this happened, what would your survival strategy be? Oh, Go on, Mike. My God, I really don't know, and I was thinking this because... I'd be shit at in the water, to be honest, as well. If we were really far away from land, I'd be like the, that girl at the, at the end of the film. I'd just be left just floating about with no hope, basically. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I like to think that I would jump off and try and swim to safety. But also I would be tempted to maybe just find a really quiet place to just hide. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what about you? I think if you if you hid, just nothing can happen then because you're either stuck mm. there... And even if the Coast Guard comes, they're not going to necessarily know what's just happened. Mm-hmm. Wait till night and then try and swim. I mean, it is night time, isn't it? Not when that guy gets harpooned, but yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, the, the one person who survives does swim. Oh, no, she takes the boat. It's got to get to shore. That's all. That's, that's the only way. I mean, those waters will be absolutely freezing. And they're quite and they're quite far out, aren't they? Like it's not like they're just off the shore, are they? I think. I mean, I mean it doesn't look that close. No, that would be some considerable swimming against a current, probably. Quite, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit kind of open water type situation, mm. which also really freaks me out. So yeah, uh, I don't know. I'd be rubbing. I'd be. I'd be gone. Basically, I'd be <laughs> dead. Yeah. Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Yeah, grieve for me. Yeah. Ah, oh. what about? The what's the other death that I really liked? Somebody gets set on fire at one point, don't they? As well. Yes, that's, that's really a good. hazard. That's an interesting <laughs> scene, isn't it? Yeah. The mama of the family. Mm-hmm. She's like torturing the woman who's hidden in the oil drum or whatever it is. And then, yeah. I mean, this is kind of um, sensitive to race. Is that the the Japanese? The two Japanese ladies are hiding in the closet. Mm. And the one says, my grandfather was a kamikaze. Mm. And then fills the other lady's bag full of like explosives or whatever it is and sends her out towards the mum. A bit brutal that, wasn't it? Yeah. It's not great. (laughs) I feel like Mike's face says it all, which is (laughs) verbalised is the expression. Not sure about that. Not sure about that. Yeah, but I mean, there's a few people die there. Mama, the two Japanese ladies, 
mm-hmm. there's a harpoon involved in that as well, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fire. It's quite cool, but at the same time, a bit, yeah, controversial. What is it that happens? Because I, I think I must have slightly missed exactly how the the Japanese lady, the, the sort of employee, mm. ends up kind of... She ends up sort of off the ship and she ends up ashore, doesn't she? With yeah. the other, with the weird guy. She's one of the more sensible ones, I suppose. She's like, right, well, the only way to survive is to get off this boat. So she gets onto the, the boat that brought them to the ship. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then takes that to the shore. Right. But Jean-Francois is also there, and he says, don't let the others on, which is, you know, mm. a hateful thing to do. <laughs> uh, but then she proves that she's quite badass and, like, sort of gets him in a stranglehold and drives drives the boat to the shore, and then they climb up the rocks. That's yeah. how they escape. So then, so the, good good escape, mm. and then they reach this lighthouse, and she realises that the guy that's there is the guy from the beginning. The yeah. guy who was, as you say, selling his bag of creepy wares at the <laughs> harbour side. But then I was really confused. Okay. So she's kind of realised that he is part of the whale hunting family, right? Mm-hmm. And then she says, I can make you a lot of money. Mm. Yeah. What is going on there? <laughs> no idea. <sighs> yeah, I don't is know. Is she just saying, I'll pay you if you take me to the airport? Which I, I wouldn't have thought would work very well to reason with a murderous psychopath, but... I guess she's promising him maybe a lot more than that as well. Like, basically, she's able to buy her way to safety, isn't she? And yeah. I guess it links back to what you said, Rob, that maybe this film has got some sort of like the financial crisis type subtext going on maybe that like that that sort of capitalism saves her life at the end basically that she's able to buy it she's the only character really isn't she that that is able to get herself to safety and you sort of see her looking relaxed on a plane at the end um it's one of the weirdest moments of the film (laughs) none of that is explained very well at all but yeah i think maybe because she poses as yuko so her employer Mm, so mm -hmm. i guess they must have been quite a um, a well-to-do family. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and so she, if she's pretending to be them, she must have enough money to just get on a plane. But also, none of that really matters because she just lied to Anton anyway and killed him in the Land Rover. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she, could, she didn't have to have any background of money. It was just a flat-out lie. Yeah, she just knew exactly how to how to lie her way out of that situation. She got, mm-hmm. she got out of it better than anyone else did, basically, didn't she? Um, she did. Certainly better than Jean-Francois, which is, a, well, okay, another pretty great death. <laughs> <laughs> is it possible to decapitate someone by throwing an axe? Oh, I love it. <laughs> Look pretty real to me, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That was good, that moment, yeah. yeah. Can I just point out a very quick inconsistency here as well? Rob, An inconsistency? Cut, yeah, you can cut <gasps> this if you want. But at the very start when we meet Anton, he, you know, is put on this kind of straight, this persona of having some kind of disability. Then he drops the persona and he says, um, sayonara shitheads, <laughs> which infers he knows that the whale watching family are going to come and kill these people. Mm-hmm. But at that point, they don't even know that that whale watching expedition is on its way, do they? Because mm. isn't it later when they have the call out and the guy says, anybody in the area seen any whales, that then they think, oh yeah, this is our chance. Yeah, it's all a happy accident the way they end up at the, yeah, the whale hunters, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Maybe he just knows. He's like, maybe this happens a lot yeah. all the time. It's like, you're probably gonna, you're yeah. going to end up bumping into those guys and you'll be dead. Um, yeah, it's true though. That is because how would he know that? It, it is just kind of random that they bump into them, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it's very unimportant in the grand scheme of things, but <laughs> uh, yes, I but mean, it annoyed me. I think mm. that phrase applies to this film in the context of Icelandic cinema in general. <laughs> but you know, there aren't many Icelandic horrors at all. We recently discussed a film called I Remember You, which is a creepy sort of ghost mm. story. But mm. considering how dark it gets in Iceland and all these, you've, there's so many sort of locations and folk tales and things that you could delve into to make horror films. It's surprising that there aren't that many. So here we have one and all it's doing really is playing on 
typical convention. Feels like a missed opportunity. Yes, yeah. which maybe Sean has realised later in his career. I guess there was... I was trying to look for threads in this with some of the other films that we've seen. Mm. And I mean, there aren't a huge amount of threads, but one of them is <laughs> this um, tension that we've discussed throughout the two series of this old Iceland versus new Iceland, which is something that has been in a lot of the films we've seen, yeah. which here is seen in the old whale hunting industry, traditional ways versus, um, and kind of an, internalized view of Iceland you know as an island as its own community not connected to the world versus this new whale watching version of Iceland which is global welcoming to tourists Mm -hmm. so that is is something that we've seen at play in other films like Rams for example yes which is the only other Icelandic film I think Mike's seen yeah until Lamb and this now I've seen two more in the space of a week but uh... (laughs) It was for a very long time. It was just Rams. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 that, I loved that, that it was like my first two Icelandic films were Rams and Lamb. Um, <laughs> this one's quite different though. This one's quite different. Yeah. I mean, sheep are a crucial part of Icelandic life mm-hmm. and always have been. Whales also, I suppose. So actually it's quite surprising we've not seen much whale in our series so far. We had one character once talk about not wanting to eat minky whale in a film Mm. called Echo, which is the type of whale they're actually looking for in this film. Which then, when Annette and Marianne get attacked by an orca, also known as a killer whale, Mm -hmm. it's got, that's a joke, right? Well, I did look up and apparently there are, because I was like, really? An orca? But apparently there are orcas in some parts of Iceland. Mm -hmm. Well, Um, it's, Iceland is where they let uh, Kiko go after he finally got released from being in Free Willy. Oh, uh, maybe it was him. Maybe that was Free Willy. <laughs> oh my God, getting his own back. <laughs> oh. I think you've just broken my mind. <laughs> <laughs> who, who would have thunk a children's film from the nineties was related to? There you go. This. You see. There you go. It's I was mad. hoping to have seen a, a bit more whale in this. Actually, you know, like I thought. Worst case scenario is we're going to see lots of lovely Icelandic landscapes and we're going to see some whales and that kind of thing i was quite sad that we didn't really get much whale action until the very very end i i agree with you actually Mm. because it doesn't really live up to its title in the Mm. whale part of it (laughs) no Uh, i mean i've i haven't been on a whale watching tour but you gotta imagine they do happen where no one sees any whales Mm. um so that part probably rings i wonder if the budget didn't extend to whales Mm, mm-hmm. Probably. What is it? What is it? It's a whale. A big one. A whale? Yeah. A whale? No. no don't go, don't go. Maybe it's here to help us, to help us. Like the dolphins will help the fishermen on the way back to the harbour. What the hell are you doing? So the only part of the film that we do see whales which we probably should have said at the start of this chat, was the opening credits. Mm. The gritty archival footage, real footage of whale hunting, Mm. traditional whale hunting, and then whale slaughter as well. This really, um, you know, my illusions of maybe going into a fun Piranha 3 double D style film, like I mentioned (laughs) earlier, this opening sequence really put those illusions to bed. And I thought, well, I'm not going to be getting that, am I? It was like weirdly melancholic for a film that's essentially like a kind of, torture porny slasher thing yeah again i guess it's kind of just introducing that kind of brutality and kind of almost sort of nihilism or something to this film from the beginning isn't it it's like this is what you're gonna get misery and death (laughs) very much yeah (laughs) and also because the music is so kind of sad which doesn't fit with the rest of the the Mm. soundtrack Mm -hmm. it's almost like they're trying to make you think oh look how sad it is that Ison's whale hunting has has gone away now. <laughs> I was like, well, no, it's horrific. Look at it. Um, although yeah. it was one of the most, it was the most one of the most important ways that the traditionally Icelanders were able to sustain themselves. Mm. Mm-hmm. Whale was an important part of their diet, which I guess mm. it isn't so much anymore. I guess it also had the massacre illusions, right? So we saw like 
meat being carved up and blood and kind of awful type stuff, which obviously is like there's going to be a massacre. Yeah. There is a reference to that. Mm -hmm. And I guess that is also kind of connecting to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because in that there's a lot of imagery of dead animals and slaughterhouses and then these people end up being slaughtered like animals do kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I guess there is a kind of connection there as well. Yeah. See, there's more Texas Chainsaw Massacre than I, than you perhaps thought. <laughs> <laughs> but I am I am under no illusions that this is not the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Mike. I'm not going to put my horror credentials yeah, on good, the table here. Good. I'd never I, I, I'd never have you back on my podcast again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cycle back to another death now. Leon's death is probably the most darkly comic moment of the film, I would say. Because he has, for all intents and purposes, saved Marianne, if no one else. Mm -hmm. And then he thinks, great, I've got the bad guy at the end of a gun. The Coast Guard's here. This is perfect. I can just wait. They'll kill him and, and I'll be safe. And then, of course, they don't see it that way. As you were talking about earlier, Mike, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a, a black guy with a gun pointing it at a native Icelander. Mm. Yeah. You said darkly comic, but I feel like events in the last couple of years just made this moment seem quite bleak to me. I suppose so, yeah. I don't I guess it would have obviously had some of the same illusions when it was made in two thousand and nine, but perhaps not quite the same explicit <laughs> It wasn't quite at the forefront of audiences' yeah. minds necessarily, I think, was it? Yeah. Um, no, I think perhaps back then it was focusing less on race and more just like look, mm. this is a awkward situation that the guy who thinks he saved everyone is about to die there's mm. no real i don't know maybe maybe he was but i think probably it was just uh yeah look at the confusion yeah and the kind of last grisly joke almost isn't it a little bit mm -hmm. but but like it I, I do quite like it when he got shot but then still managed to shoot the other guy and his head <laughs> just like exploded <laughs> off his body that it yeah. kind of went like scanners or something that was great i enjoyed yeah. that that was that was mm. proper good, yeah. good gore right there. Yeah, yeah. It kind of felt a bit like, obviously, Rob. We go to Fright Fest often, right? It's this mm -hmm. sort of felt like the sort of film they'd play at Fright Fest at like eleven o'clock at night when For sure. everyone is a bit tired and drunk and they just put on something really stupid and gory <laughs> and schlocky mm -hmm. uh, that late at night, right? And th this felt like exactly that type of film, didn't it? I think. Yeah, I can imagine being super tired on like day four mm -hmm. and and trying to decide whether we should stay for that final film on that day mm -hmm. and going for it and then you just sort of at that point nothing none of the jokes or perhaps if there's any actual undercurrent or context yeah none of that would have hit us no. we would have just been like here's some more <laughs> awful people being killed in awful ways exactly yeah uh, yeah it's very much that i wonder if this played at fright fest actually it feels like it it would have but who knows yeah oh it did play at Glasgow Fright Fest 2010. There you go. I did just it? Found it? Yeah. There you go. Okay. On the, it was oh, and go. it was the last movie on the Saturday night. So we we're probably right, Rob. It would have been like 11 <laughs> p.m. Yeah. On that like third day, so we were spot on. Brilliant. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it is what it is, isn't it? There's a whole bunch of awful people being killed in awful ways. Do you have any other things you want to mention? Any final thoughts? I'd say I've seen better films, but I've also seen worse films. Not many. That's the <laughs> most generic answer I've ever heard. Any. You can cut that out. <laughs> uh, my one favourite moment was probably where Free Willy made an appearance at the end. Oh, and I yeah. thought, you know, bring some, bring them down, basically. Mm -hmm. Get your revenge. And the only person I really backed in this whole film was the whale. Fair. I mean, no one killed any whales in this film. 
It's true. It's true. Apart from that kind of horrible opening credit sequence. Mm. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> from many um, years ago. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I would say this is like, you know, I've probably seen worse because I've seen so many bad horror films, but um, <laughs> it's sort of surface level f- fine, isn't it? Like I didn't, yeah. I don't think I was bored. I wasn't like, this has gone on too long in a way. Like it kind of does what it does. It's only 90 minutes or 88 minutes or something. Yeah. And if you don't mind just watching a bunch of really awful people get slaughtered in really horrible ways, then this film kind of delivers on that, yeah. doesn't it? I suppose it gives you it gives you that at least that kind of visceral and thrill. I would say it actually wasn't as horrible and gruesome and horrendous as I was afraid it was going to be. Um, mm. So, like you say, it it happened. <laughs> passed by in 90 minutes <laughs> put that on the poster it happened oh yeah it happened <laughs> yeah it's not it's it's very different to the kind of films we've covered uh it's definitely an outlier in terms of the uh the movies out of iceland but mm. yeah I, I i have to agree with you as much as i want to believe sean was just trolling us and the whole thing was some big joke and comment on foreigners and tourists and the financial crisis ultimately it is just a uh, a bit of a slasher mm-hmm. with some gory kills and uh, a bit of a bit of fun really there you go Reykjavik whale watching massacre <laughs> we've covered it now Ellie don't worry it's, it's done <laughs> it's done <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much for joining us for this, Mike. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been great fun. I've loved it. And, you know, I've put you through much worse films on my podcast, Rob. So, yeah, this, this was a pleasure. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this, this is true. This is not the worst horror film I've seen this year by a country mile. <laughs> um, where can people find you? Not that they need directing. Um, yeah, thank you. You can find my podcast, The Evolution of Horror, wherever you get podcasts. And we're on Twitter at Evolution Pod. And you're also on Instagram yourself now I'm on with Insta- your bunnies. I'm so down with the kids now. I'm actually on Instagram. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I'm at Mike Munzer on Instagram. Um, come find me there. That would make sense. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Ellie. And uh, we'll be back soon with, uh, with a normal, <laughs> a typical... <laughs> episode of quick quick minder pod i can't even say it now um cheers ellie see you soon bye (coughs) there we are then Reykjavik whale watching massacre maybe didn't quite live up to the precedent put forward on quick minder pod that all icelandic films are fantastic but if you're after something gory and icelandic then here's the film for you and if you want an icelandic what the fuck moment before lamb finally reaches the uk in december then there's one or two here to see you through plus It's mostly in English, so no reading required. Just kick back and watch a bunch of terrible humans die out on a fjord. Our thanks again to Mike for joining us and for correctly pronouncing Fickminderpod on his own podcast, where I recently popped up to give my initial thoughts on lamb. For more lamb chat, check out the other bonus episode that we dropped earlier this week, where we discussed the Icelandic films that screened as part of London Film Festival 2021. Normal service will resume on Monday, but in the meantime, have a horrifying Halloween and let us know what you made of this movie on our socials. That's Twitter and Instagram, at Kvikminderpod. As always, that's K-V-I-K-M-Y-N-D-A-P-O-D. And please leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks and goodbye. Tako bless. Bye. Bye. Bye.